The scripture readings today are found in the Old Testament of the Bible. The first reading is Psalms 84, located on page 543 in the Old Testament section of the Pew Bible. Listen to the word of God. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, and whose heart are always the high, highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make a place of springs. The early rains also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The gods of God will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear. O God of Jacob, behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God that live, than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. The second reading is 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 22 through 30 and 41 to 43. It is located on page 302. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. The covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth even heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain you, much less this house I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea. O Lord my God, heeding the cry and prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray to, toward this place. Oh, here in heaven, your dwelling place, heed and forgive. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays toward this house, then here in heaven, your dwelling place, 
and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you, so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. The word of the Lord. Friends, let us turn to God in prayer. Unleash among us your free and your wild spirit, O oh God, your spirit, which cannot be controlled or contained, but which can be experienced and received and followed. Take us, O oh God, take us where you want us to go. Draw out from us what you want us to become and make us into the people you want us to be. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the truth of the gospel to which both of our two texts today bear witness is that you and I have the joyous delight of worshiping a God who will not be contained or domesticated. God will not be contained in a building. God will not be contained in an ideology or a political party or a culture or a tradition or any other human construct. You and I worship a God who is free and sovereign who always eludes our attempts to grasp God, which is a fact that should bring us a lot of relief, a lot of thanksgiving, and enormous joy and energy for the living of our lives. In our turbulent time, when just this month we have seen a grand jury in Pennsylvania release a haunting report that more than 300 priests abused more than 1,000 children, more than 1,000 children in their care. A month when associates of the president have pled guilty to and were convicted of criminal activity. A month when we have seen domestic violence exposed within a Division I college football program. And all of that on top of all of the ups and the downs of our individual lives. In the midst of all of that turbulence, we hear the good news that you and I worship and serve a God whose power to save and judge and heal cannot be contained or controlled or domesticated. And it is because of that that we can face any situation that comes our way. Because God, the free and the sovereign God, is our anchor in any and every storm. Today we are wrapping up our summer sermon series on the story of King David. For some of you this will come as a sadness. For others of you, this will come as a great relief that we are concluding this series. We began the series earlier in the summer with 1 Samuel chapter 8, which was before David even entered the story, a text when the prophet Samuel warned the people that if they got the king they wanted, that they were asking for, they would regret it because kings are kings and that usually means that kings are going to take, 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 take from them. We're ending the sermon series today on the other side of David with a prayer from Solomon, David's son, one of David's sons, a character about whom the Bible has a decidedly mixed opinion. On the one hand, the church down through the ages, has often thought positively of Solomon as a great, wise, and clever king. 1 Kings chapter 3 tells the story, which you may have heard, 
story of two women who come to Solomon with a baby. Both women claim to be the baby's mother, and they are asking Solomon to resolve their dispute. Solomon orders that a sword be brought to him so that he may cleave the child in two and give half to each woman. Well, at that command, the baby's real mother screams for him to stop because she does not want the child to be harmed, while the phony mother is quite content to get her half of the child. And in that way, without the benefit of a DNA test, Solomon discovers who the child's real mother is. It's a little bit of a severe test, but it got the job done. The Bible also credits Solomon with the authorship of many proverbs. 1 Kings 4 says that he spoke 3,000 of them. And the well-loved book of Proverbs is attributed to Solomon. So the church has mostly tended to think of Solomon as wise king Solomon. But on the other hand... One does not need to read the stories about Solomon with much imagination to see that the Bible may very well have had a bit more jaded view of the man, as though Solomon were someone who played the part of the king of Israel, enjoying all of its splendor and pomp and circumstance, but who rather completely abandoned the Bible's traditional covenantal norms of faithfulness to God, justice for the poor, and attentiveness to those who are in need. 1 Kings chapter 4 describes Solomon's administration. So I'm going to point you to a couple of texts, which you're welcome to take my word for, or you can check this. 1 Kings 4 at the beginning describes Solomon's administration. It's his cabinet, if you will. And it's a rather boring list of government officials. There are scribes and priests and recorders and generals. There's someone who's in charge of the palace. And then we are told of someone named Adoniram who was in charge of the forced labor. Now, our ears perk up a little bit at that because we might have thought that Given Israel's lived experience as a people who were freed from slavery in the Exodus, their king may have steered away from something like forced labor. And we get even more curious when we realize that the term that is used for forced labor there in 1 Kings chapter 4 is the exact same term that is used in Exodus 1, verse 11, where we are told that the Egyptians set taskmasters over the Hebrew slaves to oppress them with forced labor, which I think is the Bible's way of saying that Solomon has turned out to be just another Pharaoh. And this in 1 Kings 4 is after we have read in 1 Kings 3 that Solomon married Pharaoh's daughter so that he actually became part of Pharaoh's royal family, which is as though the Bible is saying that Israel was brought out of slavery in the Exodus only to have Solomon take them right back. And now, the reason that Solomon needs all of this forced labor, we are told in 1 Kings 6 and 7, is because he has a lot of building projects he is wanting to do. He is building a royal palace, two actually, and a temple. And the narrative goes into a whole lot of detail to describe the temple, which is the subject of the reading today from 1 Kings 8. And the word that keeps popping up over and over and over and over again in the description of the construction of the temple is the word gold. Solomon covered the interior of the temple with pure gold. He overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold. 
He drew chains of gold across. Even the whole altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. Gold, 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 gold. This dude was not into being modest. 1 Kings 7 tells us about the construction of the royal palace. And although the palace construction does not get quite as many verses as the temple did, we are told that the king's palace was four times as large as the temple, which gives you a sense of where the king's priorities were. Solomon, according to the text, was a king who practiced extravagant greed and acquisitiveness. And then we are told that as soon as Solomon dies, in 1 Kings chapter 12, there is a rebellion that divides Israel into two separate kingdoms. So that it seems to me that we may say that Solomon's policies and practices of greed and self-serving acquisitiveness lead quite directly to social division and chaos. That's what greedy policies do. And all of that brings us to the royal prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings 8 is the prayer that Solomon prayed at the dedication of his great temple in Jerusalem. Solomon has built the temple to be the place where people will come to encounter God. The temple is intended to be a place of religious encounter, and it no doubt was for very many people, but it can also become a place where God is presumed to be contained. And whenever we think that we have got God contained, Whenever we think we have got God in a box, whenever we think we understand God and know all there is to know about God, then we are no longer dealing with God, but with something that is much, much smaller. Because God cannot be contained like that. The substance of Solomon's prayer is that his temple would be the place to which people would turn for help from God. He prays, heed the prayer that your servant prays towards this place when your people Israel pray with you in this house here in heaven and forgive the sin of Israel. If there is famine in the land and they stretch out their hands towards this house, then here in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act. Solomon wants the people's attention focused on his temple. And that is not the same thing as having one's attention focused on God. Solomon is attempting a rather daring feat here in his prayer, trying to locate God in one place that just so happens to be under the control of the king. But Solomon is still a child of the faith. And so even he cannot completely escape the claims of the covenant. Tucked away there in verse 27 in our reading today, Solomon briefly wonders, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. And so right there, in Solomon's own mouth, we find the gospel. God cannot be contained. God cannot be domesticated or controlled or managed, even by one as wealthy as Solomon. Which is why Psalm 84 exclaims, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Psalm 84 is talking about that temple which is lovely. Solomon spent a lot of money to be sure that it would be lovely. But the reason the temple is lovely is not because of all of the cedar and all of the gold that Solomon put there. The reason the temple is lovely is because of the presence of God. Psalm 84 
looks like a poem about a building, but it is actually a poem about a person. And it is a person who makes safe space for all people in the temple, especially for those who are vulnerable and small, so that even the little birdies can find a place of welcome there. The presence of God is the central reality of your life. And God cannot be contained in any building any more than God can be contained in a religion or a tradition or a culture. God is bigger than any of our attempts to keep God manageable and contained and safe. God is sovereign and God is free. We gather here in the sanctuary to worship God so that we will then be able to go out into the world and recognize God at work in the world. We encounter God here in the sanctuary, but we cannot contain or keep God here in the sanctuary. God is loose in the world, and we follow God out into the world to participate in God's healing work there. So friends, when you think about your life and the people you're aware of, the people you know, the people you observe, where do you notice people trying to contain God? In what ways do you observe people trying to put God in a nice little box, either so that they can use God for their own purposes or so that they can keep God from interfering in their purposes. And are there any ways that you do that? If you're anything like me, you do that in a whole variety of ways. But the promise of the gospel is that God is bigger than any of our containers, which of course means that we do not need to be contained by them either. To God and to God alone be all of the glory now and forever. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Forgive us, O oh God, when we try to contain you and keep you small and manageable and domesticated and on our side. Forgive us when we presume to know all there is to know about you. Set us free from all of our assumptions and all of our preconceived categories that are used to keep things under wraps. Free us from all of that and set us free to follow you wherever you lead us in the world. We pray for your church. We pray for ourselves as individuals, and we ask that you would release us from every captivity to which we are captive in order that we may follow you with courage, freedom, faithfulness, and joy. All these things we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.